Good afternoon. I see you survived the rain and the traffic to get here, so appreciate uh, your efforts. Uh, welcome to our celebration of service. I'm Ron Barnes, and it's an honor to be your president. The thought for the day. I make a point to appreciate all the little things in my life. I go out and smell the air after a good hard rain. Hey, do that today. These small actions help remind me that there are so many great, glorious pieces of good in the world. Dolly Parton. Our reflection, Dave Meyer. Thank you, President Ron. So I, as uh, many of you know, I like to talk about the refugee family that uh, Rotary sponsors. Uh, and I wanna thank everybody that has been involved in the club with helping that family. Uh, I have more to say about that in a minute, but I'd actually like to reflect a little bit about what it's like to be a refugee in the United States. So as you know, most of the club uh, is aware that we're helping a family of Afghan refugees resettle in Bloomington, and we've been doing that for some months. Today, I'd like to spend a few minutes reflecting on what it's like to be an international refugee in the U.S. This year, the U.S. agreed to accept 125,000 refugees. Refugees qualify for resettlement because they were forced to flee their home country because of violence or persecution and cannot return. Examples of refugees include certain Afghans that fled Afghanistan when Kabul fell, Syrians that fled the Syrian civil war, and Ukrainians fleeing the Russian invasion. When they're admitted here, they try to restart their lives in the United States. When we grant a refugee entry into the US, they start on a long path to become an American. The U.S. government provides them with some modest initial support. Each refugee gets $2,425 that is spent on their behalf for their first... Check one, two. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Check one, two. Check one, two. Check one. Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway... When we grant a refugee entry into the United States, they start on a long path to become an American. The US government provides them with some very modest initial support. Each refugee gets $2,425 that is spent on their behalf for their first three months in the US. They also qualify for one year of Medicaid, health coverage, and food stamps. I'd like to look a little deeper into the numbers and our government's expectation. Uh, the website, apartments.com, says the average cost of rent of a one-bedroom apartment in Bloomington, Indiana, is $1,035 a month. Residential energy costs, according to Rent Cafe, average $207 a month in Bloomington. My own experience with helping refugees obtain internet and cell service show that the former starts at about $50 a month and the latter starts at about $40 a month. Excluding all other required living expenses for this analysis, the allocated three months of $2,425 will last just under two months. Uh, there is no money for furniture or even a bar of soap in this analysis. Thankfully, there are folks like my sister's closet, Mother Hubbard's cupboard, St. Vincent de Paul, our club, various faith communities, and other local agencies and charities that are pitching in to help. Before coming to the US, every refugee family that I've worked with has been traumatized. Stories that I've heard include witnessing a parent being murdered in your own home by insurgents, having your home, car, and finances unjustly seized by the government, having your children and wife threatened with rape and murder because of the job you hold, and having your car driver shot to death while traveling at night. I'd like to ask everyone to reflect on what kind of America we'd like to show these people 
that have been invited into our country to restart their lives. Do we want them to have uh, to show them empathy and support, or do we want to leave them to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps? I understand this is a lot to take in, and I don't want to leave you with only negative experiences because the opportunity to start again creates so many possibilities and even joys. One of these joys is the number of refugee mothers that have given birth since arriving in Bloomington. I know of several volunteers that have been right there in the delivery room for the birth of the first American citizen in their family. Another joy is celebrating the first Thanksgiving in America when local refugees are invited into homes to feast and to reflect on their gratitude and deliverance. Earning a US driver's license and then buying a first car is a milestone that many refu local refugees have shared that opens up so many possibilities. Now looking forward, on Tuesday, June 11, at our regular celebration of service, we will celebrate the restart of the lives of Amina, Jawahir, Rahim, and Shams, the members of the refugee family that our club sponsors here in Bloomington. They will be meeting to talk about their experiences and their dreams. I hope that you will be able to join us. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, and for your leadership uh, in this project. You've done a wonderful job, service above self, and it really represents our club well, so thank you. Now to introduce our guest, <laughs> Lynn Schwartzberg. Well, thank you for that reflection. Um, I just want to add on to that. If you're interested in the story of a Syrian refugee, I just finished an amazing book called The Beekeeper of Aleppo. So it's amazing. Um, and I would also like to welcome our wonderful guest from Rotaract, Yaha Kader. Please stand up. Let's join. Thank you. And please come back and visit us anytime you're free. Thanks, Lynn. Joy, any guests online? No guests online today, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. We do have some birthdays. Uh, March 3rd was Raj Hadawi's birthday. And today is Steve Wick's birthday. Happy birthday, Steve. And tomorrow is Bob Salzberg's birthday. We have some one anniversary, two years for John Armstrong. So congratulations, John. Have some announcements. The um, Be the Match kind of thing that we set up to help Rotaract, and we have a Rotary Club member that's really matching uh, up to $250 our donations. We haven't hit the other 250 yet. So if you want to add some dollars to the coffers to help our Rotaract friends, uh, see Natalie and she'll just put it on your bill. Also, the friendship basket at the district conference, uh, Tracy is going to uh, uh, head this up, thank God. And uh, she, she has volunteered to do that as she's volunteered to do many things. But uh, see, see, see Tracy with uh, things you wanna add to the friendship basket. We have until April 20th, but uh, uh, several bottles of wine have shown up already and, and a leather portfolio and, and several nice things, but uh, continue to bring them so we can have the absolute best friendship basket because we're obviously the best club in the district. <clears throat> also, I uh, had a note that Wonder Lab has an opportunity to, to gross purchase or mass purchase uh, glasses for the solar eclipse. And again, uh, they would want us to buy a pack of 50 to sell we're not in the retail business, obviously, but if if you'd like us to purchase those 50, uh, just give me a show of hands that we should be involved in that. It doesn't look like an overwhelming majority to do that, so uh, you may have to buy your uh, glasses somewhere else, sorry. Um, we have happy dollars. Who's happy today in this small room? Lynn. It's on. Oh, 
I am so happy because I had a wonderful chat with my dear friend Sally this morning, who's not wearing glasses anymore. <laughs> Other happy dollars. Aaron. I want to welcome back Martha, Martha Foster. Who's walking in on her own. Pretty impressive. Other happy dollars? Oh. I'm very happy. I wanted to thank everybody who uh, supported us with our Friday's event. It was humongous and a ton of people dancing on the dance floor and listening to our client stories and Rotarians in the audience. And we we're very, very grateful. Including our Rotaract students. Other happy dollars out there. Okay, it's another refugee thing. <laughs> uh, I want I have five happy dollars that reflect my gratitude of finally completing all the taxes uh, for the Mohammedis, their first taxes in the United States. And I can report that everybody got a refund. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe you ought to do my taxes. <laughs> I I want to give five happy dollars to Gerona, who gave us a beautiful basket for our friendship basket from Kenya. It's gorgeous. Thank you. I want to give 20 happy dollars to Dave. I just sat on this table by coincidence, but I'm very impressed about the work you do with refugees. As an immigrant who came to this country many years ago, and someone who has worked with refugee resettlement in Kenya, in North Carolina, I am so happy to hear the stories that you're doing, and I'm happy to volunteer as needed. Thank you. Joy, do we have any happy dollars online? Anyone? Anyone? I don't think so. Thank you. Okay, and then I'd like to welcome uh, our new member uh, uh, from Wonder Lab, Leslie Kustanoko, and she is our director of philanthropic, philanthropy. Sorry, I was going to say philanthropic. So welcome, and I have a pin for you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. And also, Sandy, uh, a shout out to you for a very successful evening. So uh, you did Wonder Lab well. We had several Rotarians there representing our club. So very successful event for their 25th. I'm sorry, my sister's closet. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Now for our program, an exciting program about safety and security and, and help during a disaster, which we all need. And Judy Schroeder will be introducing our guest. Judy? Have you ever wondered what would happen if there were an active shooter alert here in the Memorial Union? Or a bomb threat? Or if there was a mental health crisis during IU's part of the eclipse? Well, our speaker today has not only wondered about these things, but he's been working towards being prepared for them. John Summerlot is IU's Director of Emergency Preparedness and Continuity. He's done that since 2022. He's internationally certified in emergency management and has won three best practice awards nationally and two honorable mention FEMAs. Uh, John is also an adjunct professor in our School of Public Health. When he, he, before he started his current job, he was the uh, director of military and veterans affairs for which he's well qualified with more than 20 years in the military as a Marine and uh, an Army National Guard. He has a master's from Naval, the Naval Postgraduate School, but he's just, you know, if I had his job, I would be, ha, ah, but he's the most laid back guy that you can imagine. So please help me welcome John Summerlot.
Hi, uh, thank you all. Uh, so a um, couple of caveats before we start. So uh, Judy had actually first met me uh, doing history work uh, here at the university, which is a hobby side gig of mine. Uh, I usually refer to myself as being an IU history nerd. Uh, sometimes I refer to myself as the adjunct deputy assistant to Jim Capshu. Uh, and when, when Jim decides that he's too busy for something, he'll ask me if I want to take on some project to go dig through the archives and I'll find some time to, to do that. Um, one of the ongoing projects that I've worked on is the Golden Book. Uh, I've been working on this uh, since about 2008. Uh, the Golden Book actually started in 1898. And it is a record of all of the IU uh, sons and daughters who have served in the wars of the Republic. Uh, so in some ways, it's our oldest history project. It's our oldest veterans history project. It is actually the memorial in the name Indiana Memorial Union. Uh, it is in the memorial room upstairs across from Starbucks, if you've never had the chance to see it. Uh, we do have an online digital version of it now uh, as well. Uh, and... Uh, the, if you go to the online version, you look under Veteran Stories, you'll also see a link to our YouTube channel. Uh, I am by no ways what my kids call an influencer, uh, but we do have a YouTube channel where we tell the stories of a lot of our veterans and IU history that, that go along with it. So, uh, so yeah, I, I get caught up in a lot of that stuff. Uh, and part of my work in emergency management is often as the COVID pandemic was coming, people were like, well, what did we do back in 1918? And I'm like, oddly enough, I know that. Uh, let's talk about that. So, uh, so yeah, so IU Public Safety, uh, we are a university-wide asset. We are not assigned to any particular campus uh, in that sense. We don't, uh, I work with the provost, uh, and, but I don't answer to the provost. I answer up to the president. Uh, and this is true of all of public safety. We're divided into four divisions across the state, uh, North, Central, South, and Bloomington. Bloomington gets its own division. And I have the uh, unique role of being the only person responsible for two divisions. Uh, so I'm responsible for both Bloomington and the Southern Division and everything that comes out of that. Uh, so that means New Albany, Bradford Woods, uh, Columbus, uh, the med site in Evansville, the Washington DC uh, office, the geological research station in Montana, the writer's retreat in Martha's Vineyard, the five international offices, and all of our study abroad programs wherever they end up at or go to. Um, so to put this in perspective, when about the three weeks before we shut down the campus for COVID, uh, we ran seven days a week, uh, about 12 hours a day, pulling students back from overseas that were in programs in countries that were closing. Uh, and so trying to convince a 19 year old in Italy that their program has closed and that deciding to backpack across Europe to get home is not a good choice at this moment. And mom and dad would really rather they come home immediately because trying to explain to them that Germany is about to close is just really a lost concept, right? Uh, and so um, lots of good times that kind of go along with that. Uh, so I work hand in hand uh, with Chief Bennett, who is the IUPD chief for Bloomington, and Chief Miller, who is the Southern Division chief uh, based out of New Albany. Uh, they're my counterparts uh, on the public safety side of things that we do. And I already introduced myself. So uh, staying safe and prepared, that's part of our job. So uh, emergency management has five phases. We have prevention, we have uh, mitigation, we have preparedness, we have response and recovery. And a lot of people get the response side. <laughs> <clears throat> something bad happens, uh, you, you notify goes out, the sirens go off, all those sort of things, people sort of understand the response side. But that's a very small fraction of what our job actually is. We spend a whole lot more time doing preparedness, mitigation, those things to try and get us ready, and then doing recovery afterwards. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today really sort of hits on those areas, but I'll talk about the response piece a little bit as well. So we do this with a lot of teamwork and collaboration. Uh, my office here in Bloomington, I have three coordinators that work for me. I have one coordinator down at Southeast. Statewide, we have 13 people that work in emergency management. We're the largest emergency management unit in the Big Ten, uh, but we're also one of the largest universities in the Big Ten as far as geographic area and, and being spread out. Uh, we take an all hazards approach. That means we don't worry about just one thing. We get everybody in a room together and we say what could happen and how would we deal with that. 
Uh, that puts a lot of people out of their comfort zone, right? When you start asking police officers to talk about what they would do during a fire, uh, you know, they get a little confused about what would happen. And if you take a uh, vice provost of academic affairs and you say, what would you do during a power outage? They'd be like, I sit there till the power comes back on, right? Uh, so helping them sort of understand what the impacts are and, and what they do. We also use a whole community philosophy, and these are emergency management terms that, that we use. Uh, whole community means we engage with students, we engage with faculty, we engage with everybody that we can in this effort. We don't just sit there and write a plan and stick it on a shelf and say, okay, if we need it, we'll, we'll pull it out and do it and just hope that everybody knows it when it happens. Um, so we do a lot of outreach and education things like we're like I'm doing today. We do a lot of training and preparedness, which I'll talk about here in a minute. And we have a pretty practiced response system. Uh, so we, we, we use our response system for a lot of things that aren't just responding to incidents because that way we get a lot more practice in. So who's our public safety team? So first off, our office, emergency management and continuity that I mentioned before. There's gonna be a bunch of names that pop up on this slide and I realize like bad practice to throw a whole bunch of bullet points up there, but I want you to sort of grasp the, the, the diversity of the groups that we work with. Environmental health and safety uh, here on campus. They're the ones that control all the labs that have the methyl ethyl bad and the bio this and the bio that and the nuclear radiation stuff. We work with them to make sure we have good plans and procedures in place for those. We work with the police department, obviously. They're kind of our front line uh, of things and things are going wrong. They're usually the first ones to call. We work with the IU Police Academy. Uh, so the IU Police Department runs one of the six police academies in the state. Um, so not only do we train our own police officers, we are training police officers across the state that are going into other agencies for how to, to do this work. We also have public safety dispatch. Uh, so we have a dispatch center here on our campus that dispatches for all nine campuses, plus it is the backup 911 for Monroe County. So if you ever call Monroe County and they can't answer the phone, it rolls over to IU dispatch uh, to answer that phone when it comes in. We have a physical security and access team. They're the ones that are responsible for cameras and card readers and all those sort of things that you, you see around campus. And then universities are uniquely uh, situated in that there's something called the Gene Cleary Act. And the Cleary Act requires us to report crimes that happen on campus. It requires us to send out notifications saying this happened on campus. Uh, if you were to get these from the city, you would suddenly realize like how much crime may happen in Bloomington or Monroe County and how much little crime happens on campus. But on the flip side, since you only hear about it from campus, people think that more crimes happen on campus than they do out in the community, which isn't the case. Uh, but we're legally obligated by the federal government to report those. And then we have an IT systems and support group, which is actually kind of, you'll, you'll hear a lot about them as we go through this and the role they play uh, in doing this. And then we have our campus partners that we work with. Uh, so the Office of Insurance Loss Control and Claims, which is known as NLOC, they're our fire safety and, and insurance office. IU Event Services, uh, so everybody from the, the red coats at uh, uh, campus events to the secure, CSC security that's working gates and those sort of things. Uh, so anybody happen to be at Assembly Hall last Tuesday, maybe around seven in the evening? Um, so great example of how we all have to work together uh, when the fire alarm goes off in assembly hall. Uh, by the way, a six minute evacuation time for a little over 12,000 people is amazing. Good job, great work. Um, really, really happy with that. But that takes a lot of planning and practice and effort to be able to, to do that when that sort of thing happens. Uh, the next day I got calls from all of my Big Ten colleagues wanting to know what set it off and how that happened and how they can make sure it never happens at their school. Um, so yeah, good times. We have a meeting about that on Thursday where I'm going to talk to them. Uh, we work with IU Athletics, of course, because they bring in a lot of our largest venues uh, and, and attractions that we do. The Luddy School has a crisis technology innovation lab. Uh, we work with them on a lot of cutting edge communications and, and radio stuff, uh, as well as, as being able to do things. Uh, so for instance, uh, some of y'all that were around campus last year, you may remember an incident that's often referred to as the sewer man incident. Technically it was a storm drain. I, but when I say storm drain man, nobody knows what I'm talking about, but sewer man. Uh, so when that happened, I was actually in training in a Homeland Security program in Washington, DC. 
Uh, and so while it was happening, I'm sitting in Washington, D.C., and I had uh, FBI, Border Patrol, um, um, D.C. Metro Police, a couple of fire agencies, a um, couple of Homeland Security folks that are all standing behind me over my shoulder, watching me with my laptop up and a portable monitor. And I have real-time footage from our security camera system, from the body cameras of the officers that are on the scene, from our drone, which we flew down and landed in the middle of the creek bed and turned the thermal camera on so we could see when he came around the corner underneath the uh, 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 sewer line. Uh, and getting real-time reports about what's happening from our communications people and what messages are going out. And when the FBI guy turns to you and says, you realize we don't have anything like this, right? Uh, I was like, so you should talk to the Crisis Technology Innovation Lab, uh, right? So this is where they, a lot of my colleagues sort of joke that they want to come work in higher ed uh, after meeting me and work because we have the coolest stuff because we get to do a lot of things. Uh, we work with the Department of Criminal Justice, which is an academic unit. Uh, they have really helped us develop our after action review system, which I'll talk about here in a minute, and how we meet some of those policies for uh, Homeland Security and public safety. Uh, through the Dean of Students Office, we work hand in hand with a demonstration response and safety team. This is the folks that handle campus protests. They're kind of the frontline folks that are uh, out there doing that work. Uh, I was a part of that team, uh, helped get that team started about six years ago in the dean's office uh, before I moved over to, to public safety. We also have the behavioral consultation team. Uh, this is the team in the dean's office that handles any sort of uh, uh, behavior issues, reported problems. I had a student that uh, stopped showing up for class with three weeks left in the semester, had been one of those model students, front of class, asked questions, did homework, all this sort of stuff, suddenly just stopped showing up. Um, so I reported her to the care team and I said, hey, I'm worried about the student that stopped showing up. Uh, and the care team was able to reach out to her and find out she had had a, a parent that passed away uh, and had stopped attending classes. The dean's office was able to then provide a bunch of support to her in that process. But it was because I, as a faculty member, had reached out and, and done that. Uh, so they are also the ones when somebody says, hey, there's a student I'm concerned about mental health wise or an employee that I'm concerned about mental health wise. This same team, which is made up of law enforcement and counselors and social workers and HR specialists and lawyers, they're the ones that come together to take that information and figure out what work we can do to try and support somebody who might be going through crisis or average onset of mental health issues in the U.S. population. Anybody know the age? 17 to 24. So average onset of mental health issues coincides with college age. So they keep busy uh, on the care team with, with looking at those sort of things. Uh, we work with Monroe County Emergency Management uh, quite a bit. Uh, Jamie, who's the county emergency manager, has me on speed dial, uh, and we touch base a lot. We work with all the law enforcement and fire departments within the county. Uh, we often borrow them for football games and those sort of things. So Ellettsville PD, Monroe County Sheriff, uh, we will borrow their resources and assets uh, for, for big events. Indiana State Police, we work with quite a bit uh, as well. Uh, they work a lot of our, our athletic events. And the Indiana Department of Homeland Security, in fact, we have uh, five members of our team that are part of the state incident management team as well. So if there is a tornado that happens somewhere in the state, we are part of the team that gets sent there, even if it's not an IU campus. Uh, and we've been deployed as far away as the Florida Keys for a hurricane. Uh, through interstate uh, uh, mutual aid. So we get a lot of experience responding to disasters. Uh, my boss likes to say I'm the only person that shows up to a disaster with a smile on their face, uh, right? And it, part of it's because we just, this is what we do. This is our, our game day. Uh, imagine if you were a football player and you never played a game against another team, right? It'd get boring after a while. So every time something happens, hey, that's our game day. We're on, we're good, right? Uh, and then we work with the FBI, the local FBI uh, unit here in Bloomington, as well as Indianapolis. Uh, we work with them for any sort of major threats to campus. Uh, a lot of them you may never hear about, right? Uh, so we had a student last year uh, when IU won the IU Purdue basketball game. Uh, we had a Purdue student that made an online bomb threat to the university uh, through social media. Social media reported it to the FBI. The FBI called us and said, hey, uh, we don't think this person's anywhere near your campus, but we want you to be on alert for it. And so at two o'clock in the morning, we spent a whole lot of time making sure that campus was prepared for it while the FBI managed to track him down by calling his mom, 
uh, to find out where he was and what was going on. Uh, so you can imagine that phone call as a parent at two in the morning. Hi, this is the FBI. We'd like to know where your son is. Uh, and turned out he was he was in his residence hall room up in West Lafayette, uh, to which the, our counterparts at the Purdue PD uh, paid him a nice visit uh, about that. So, uh, yeah, so we do a lot of those sort of things that never really reach the news or, or never get out there in a, in a public sort of way. And we're perfectly OK with that. Uh, so. As I mentioned, we do a lot of time doing training and preparedness work. Uh, so a lot of this is as is, is simple as teaching classes, talking with groups. Um, some of it is things like teaching students that live in an apartment complex how to use fire extinguishers because they've never used them before. Um, so we'll go out and set stuff on fire and bring in fire extinguishers and, and let them learn to do it. Uh, the bottom photo is actually from an exercise we run every August with the residence hall staff. It's called The Great Escape. Uh, we put fake smoke into a residence hall hallway and we run all the residence hall staff through it as an opportunity for them to understand what it might look like or feel like if they had to escape a residence hall uh, during a fire. And BFD is a great partner with us in doing that uh, to put on that event. Uh, we also run some very specialized sort of programs by request. Uh, so that top program, uh, IU has the oldest search and rescue training, collegiate search, search and rescue training program in the country. Uh, that is actually a picture from our class this past weekend uh, out in Hoosier National Forest. And those are IU students and first responders that are enrolled in the class taking it. Uh, the bottom photo uh, is Major Luce, uh, one of our police officers and his wife, uh, teaching a self-defense class, uh, which they were invited to come in and do by uh, the, this group of women. Uh, and so we do a lot of this outreach stuff uh, to help folks sort of understand both what the threats are, but also how can we respond to it as individuals or volunteers within the community. We do a lot of drills. To be clear, the one at Assembly Hall was not a drill, that was an actual alarm, but we do a lot of drills, uh, whether those are tornado drills or fire drills or any of those sort of things, that's a big piece of the work that we do. Uh, so we're the ones that are, that are responsible when some senior administrator or faculty member gets mad their class was interrupted and says, who, who scheduled this? It was us, um, that was, it was, I take the heat on that. We do a lot of exercises. Uh, so this is actually an active aggressor exercise uh, at the Columbus campus that we did last year. We get all of the folks together in a room to talk through, okay, the police are responding and we kind of walk through the scenario. Police are responding, they're doing this. What are you doing as the chancellor for the campus? What are you doing as a communications folks? What are you doing as the uh, lead academic person? And we kind of walk through that process of what it would look like so that the first time they end up in that situation, they're not completely lost on who's doing what and, and what sort of job. We treat all of our events like they are emergencies. Uh, so this is the law enforcement briefing for a football game. Uh, to give you an idea of what law enforcement coverage looks like for a football game, we treat it just like it's a disaster or an emergency. Uh, we bring them in beforehand, we do a safety briefing, we make sure everybody's on the same page with the info, uh, and then we send them out with the same forms and in the same process that we do for an emergency. Uh, our events themselves, so these are photos from uh, also from a football game. Uh, we run a command center offsite during the football game. Uh, we actually uh, take over a large classroom uh, to do it. We have multiple screens. We have everything from drone cameras in the air to our all of our safety cameras pulled up, radio communications with event services, police, fire, ambulance. We're tracking everything that happens in the tailgate fields, on the roads, and in the stadium just like we would during a disaster or an emergency, right? We call these planned disasters, by the way. Uh, that way we, we actually get that same experience of, of doing much of the same thing. Uh, we do a lot of outreach. Um, so these are my officers uh, down at IU Southeast uh, doing some tabling, reaching out to students. Uh, for a lot of students, the first time they ever meet a police officer is at a tabling event. The first time they've ever talked to a police officer. Uh, that maybe wasn't in a, what are you kids doing, you know, sort of way, right? So the more we can put our officers out there, put our public safety staff out there to talk with folks, uh, the better off we are at, at making those connections. Uh, we also use our canines. Uh, they are our canine ambassadors in many ways. Um, so the top dog that's up there is Honey. She is actually an emotional support animal uh, The IUPD uses during traumatic events, uh, sexual assaults, any of those sort of things. They can bring her in 
uh, to help console uh, uh, somebody that's reporting those issues or problems. The bottom two, who are also very happy-go-lucky dogs for being police dogs, uh, are actually bomb dogs. Uh, and so cash on the left and Indy on the right. Um, so before we have football games or uh, concerts or basketball games, they're in there sweeping the venues, checking them beforehand, all those things that kind of go along with it. Um, they, when they're working, they will not be distracted by a tennis ball, but I promise you, if you throw a tennis ball into a room with all three of them in it, you better have three tennis balls. Uh, so, uh, and as I said before, we have a very practiced response system. Um, so the initial response comes from a group we call the incident management team. Uh, anybody in public safety, anybody that's a part of the leadership of the university or that's part of our EOC group, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, can activate the incident management team. Uh, it literally, from the time the button is pushed by dispatch or by one of us, it's somewhere around two minutes until the first members of the incident management team are in the video bridge and online ready to be briefed about what is happening. Um, it's literally as fast as I can click a link on my phone after getting the message. Uh, I'm in there. Um, so an example of what uh, the IMT gets called for, anytime uh, somebody gets overwhelmed, doesn't have the resources they need in that moment, they can activate the IMT. Uh, we had a power outage uh, on campus back January or so. We had a couple of them over a couple of weeks that, that happened there. During one of the incidents, uh, power went out to the Greek houses and everything on North Eagleson, including the police station uh, on North Eagleson. And Duke came out and they said, yeah, the problem is a tree on this line. But the other problem is the line below it is still turned on and the line below it is an IU line. So we need IU high voltage folks to come out and shut down power to that line before we can work on getting the tree off the line above it. And the police officer was like, that makes no sense to me whatsoever. I do not understand what you're saying, but I have a team that can solve this problem. And from standing by the side of the road, he hit a button. Next thing you knew, we had two AVPs from facilities that were on the phone with him uh, saying, yeah, we can get the people out there to shut off that power line and help out with this and we'll get all that done. So you wonder how a police officer on patrol is able to bring in electricians and plumbers and everybody else they might need. They push a button uh, and the team responds and shows up and we go with it from there. Uh, we have an expanded response through our emergency operations center team. So our EOC team, emergency operations center team, has about 80 some odd folks that are members of it. Uh, and they represent all specialty areas and functions within campus, everything from student affairs and student life to academic affairs. Uh, if we have a building that loses power, we will have somebody from academic affairs that is figuring out what classes don't have power and what to do about those classes at the same time that if it's a residence hall, student affairs folks are figuring out if we need to move somebody or put somebody somewhere else during that time. Uh, they're all part of our EOC team. We have specialists that deal with everything from lab animals to computer research. Um, so if any of those things go down, we pull them into the EOC team and they're part of our IMT. Uh, and we're able to go from there about what it is that we're going to do and how we respond. Uh, then we have our recovery team. So if something happens, we had an apartment fire off campus uh, a couple of years ago, two years ago now. Uh, that impacted about 45 students. Uh, wasn't our building, wasn't our facility, but they were our students. So the Dean of Students rolled out there, we activated our IMT, we got some of our EOC members out there. Uh, we were able to provide some, some grants to them through some student aid programs that they were able to buy to replace some of the stuff that they lost. We were able to put them in temporary housing within the residence hall system uh, and within our, our houses for rent on campus during that time. And the Dean of Students was able to reach out to all their faculty and let all their faculty know they'd gone through this great trauma. Uh, and what do we do from here and how do we respond to that? Um, so that's part of our recovery team that comes into play there when we do that. Uh, the recovery team handles a lot of things uh, that you may not, you know, that don't even make the news. Uh, we have student death, faculty death, uh, you know, severe student injury problems, something like that. They're also, that recovery team will often activate to help out and, and work with them as well. And then everything we do has a comprehensive after action report. Every IU notify message that goes out, we automatically have a meeting within the next five to seven days to discuss why we sent the message, how did we respond to it, what did we do well, what did we not do well, what could we do better in the future. Uh, and so every time we have an IMT, almost every time we have an IMT call, 
uh, we have an after action review that goes along with it. Those all result in a published document at the end. And we can go back for years and look at, hey, we said we were going to get better at this three years ago. And we clearly didn't get better at this. Uh, but we also assign tasks to people and we say, you know, hey, this didn't get fixed last time. So this time it's your job to make sure that you get it fixed, Steve. And now it's on Steve to make sure that it gets fixed. Um, so we have that level of accountability that, that goes along with it. Uh, so that's kind of an overview of what we do. Um, this same system is replicated across all of the campuses. So whether it's Kokomo or South Bend or Indianapolis, we have the same IMT and EOC system uh, that we use for all those. We do large events on all the campuses at some point or another, large being relative. You know, uh, some of our campuses, the largest event they have is graduation uh, that happens. But uh, we do our best to, to make this system as a best practice. Most of the Big Ten has attempted to follow us uh, in what it is that we're doing and, and set up very similar systems uh, that they use. Uh, I'll also point out my email address and my phone number are up there. Uh, you're always welcome. If you have a question about campus safety, emergency response, any of those things, reach out, let me know. Uh, our job is to be the concierge, that front line of, hey, here's what happened and here's why, and here's what I can tell you and what I can't tell you about what happened. Sometimes it's just because we don't know yet. So for those of y'all that are curious, we do not know why the smokehead went off in Assembly Hall. We're still working on that. We know it was a smokehead. We know where it was. We still don't know why it went off. Um, but yeah, so questions. Thank you, John. Um, you know, you kind of uh, took away my question there when you said you didn't don't know why the alarm went off. I've, I've got a uh, good guess for you. Uh, the place was evacuated at uh, 10.06, uh, left on the uh, second half scoreboard clock. And as those of us who attend the game know, uh, there's usually an announcement reminding people that beer sales will be discontinued. <laughs> uh, no beer sales after 10 minutes. Coincidence? I, I think not. Somebody's trying to get that extra <laughs> minute in on the beer sales. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but at any rate, I just wondered, um, we, we started offering beer sales mm -hmm. at basketball, men's and women's and, and football games. Uh, has there been an appreciable increase in, in misbehavior. Recently at a, a men's game, um, it, it got pretty ugly. There was a guy seated in my row. Uh, behind us was uh, were a couple of fans from Nebraska and they were ridiculing uh, IU. IU was down 20 points at the half. And uh, this guy decided, and he was uh, juiced up uh, to go up there and, and take, uh, take care of the uh, problem with the Nebraska fans. But uh, any, any uh, it comments on that or do you yeah. track those? Yeah, so we do. We um, we keep a running log of all the events that happen at, at all of the athletic um, contests. Uh, and so we can go back and look at it and compare it year to year, like what we've seen and what has happened. Um, anecdotally, I will say that we have not had medical transport wise, we have not seen an increase in medical transports. Uh, there may be a little bit of an uptick in uh, behavior related sort of pieces, particularly at basketball games. Uh, but at football games, it stayed fairly constant that some of that has to do with the majority of the drinking at football games, often being outside of the stadium, people already showing up intoxicated coming into the stadium. Um, whereas basketball, we don't see as much of that. Um, if anything, probably our, our bigger challenge, we've had more arguments over people trying to leave with alcohol from the basketball games, uh, you know, trying to like walk out, carrying it with them. You know, it's like, no, you can't take that to your car. Bring that back. No, uh, we've had a number of those sort of incidents that we didn't obviously have to deal with before. So. Um, as in regards to the eclipse on the 8th of April, um, how many like in mere like numbers are you expecting on the IU campus? Um, I know you can't speculate the whole community, but. Oh, I can. I can. can you, I will. I can, can, you, can and I can will. Can you um, just yeah. enlighten us about actual numbers yeah. that we're looking? Because I'm sure you're prepared and have been for a while. Yeah. So we had our first meeting about the eclipse almost two years ago. Uh, and we had been talking about it for probably a year before that. Uh, we actually started planning for it at the last eclipse that ran through the, the edge of Southern Indiana. Uh, and what I mean by that is we immediately went out to Southern Illinois University Edwardsville and Hopkinsville, Kentucky. And we said, we want to know everything you did and what worked and what didn't, what went well, what didn't, because we have an eclipse in five years and we want to know what to do about it. 
so what we know from uh, research we've done about other like size communities that are center of the totality path, um, the day of the eclipse, if the weather is nice, we may have an additional 300,000 people in Monroe County. That is, so for perspective, on an Ohio State football game, we maybe have an additional 35 to 40,000 people that are in the county. Uh, so now you're talking, you know, in the neighborhood of six times that that'll be here. Uh, the traffic jam uh, that ensued uh, both in Hopkinsville and um, Southern Illinois University Edwardsville and in Wyoming after their last eclipse, the equivalent of that would be that if everything from Bloomington to Kokomo was at a standstill. So uh, we, we have lots of plans in place. Uh, we have towing companies that are ready to, pull, to pick up all the people who've run out of gas by the side of the road. Um, fun fact, electric cars, great. Uh, they'll tow them to an electric uh, station, but then you will still have to push them up to the electric station uh, if there's not one available when they pull up. Um, so uh, we've had a lot of concerns about people having to push their electric cars up to the station. Uh, we know the roads will be jammed for ambulance, fire, police traffic that goes along with that. Uh, for the campus, we're dividing the campus into four zones, and we will have uh, law, fire, and medical uh, assigned to each zone. Uh, they're going to be mobile on golf carts and uh, Kubotas and those sort of things so that they can stay off the roads and, and not have to worry about that. Uh, we've worked with the county to designate alternate lifeline uh, locations that they can land the helicopter if they need to get somebody and can't get them through traffic. Um, so we've designated about 26 other helicopter landing zones in the county. Um, to that way you can just take them to the closest one. Uh, we are, we are making golf cart ambulances as we speak, uh, that will be able to, uh, move around campus that day and, and get things, uh, where they need to be. Of course, we have the event at the stadium. We're expecting 30,000 people, uh, at the event at the stadium. Uh, we ha will have another event at Dunmeadow, which is mostly college student bands. Uh, and then in the Arboretum is a lot of our academic resources, festival sort of atmosphere that'll be happening as well. Uh, and then every road and place will be packed. So the question was asked of me earlier, where should I watch the eclipse from? Uh, and I will borrow from my academic colleagues in astronomy and say your backyard. Uh, that is, uh, if you want to come to campus that day uh, or, or you're interested in coming to any of the events, I really encourage if you can use alternative transportation, and by that I mean walk or ride a bike or any of that, please do. Um, I, I said this the other day to a student and they were like, do you mean Uber? And I was like, no, no, that's not what I mean. Uber's going to have all the same problems. Uh, so uh, unless they're running golf carts, you're going you're gonna to be fine. Uh, can you go back? maybe 10 years and tell us how your emergency preparedness planning has changed, some examples sure. of that. Yeah. Uh, so EMC actually got created in 2010. Uh, before that, it was a lot of, we have a plan, it's on a shelf and we'll pull it off if somebody needs it, you know, sort of planning that we had at the university. We also had a very decentralized approach where, okay, the fire folks are going to plan for fire, law enforcement will plan for law, uh, you know, research, you got to plan on your own for whatever it is for you, uh, all that. And so uh, when our office was created in 2010, we really started bringing all those people into the same room to sit down and talk about what are we doing. 2014-15, uh, we ran a series of full-scale uh, active shooter exercises on all of the campuses uh, where, you know, we had actors that were playing the shooter and victims and all of that. We had police and fire responding to it. Uh, and that was really kind of the watershed moment of people going, oh, wait a minute, we get what emergency management does now. Uh, you know, we, we get why we do these things um, so that we can actually practice them and, and make them happen. Um, since then, uh, we spent a lot of time actually working on our pandemic plan in 2015, uh, which turned out to be uh, uh, fortuitous. Uh, in all fairness, it was a mumps outbreak on campus that, that started the pandemic planning uh, process. Uh, but we used our school public health resources and experts and were in pretty good shape when the pandemic came for knowing when it was coming and where. And we had ideas of what the response would look like, but then we had to sort of sell them to the academic side and the president and all of this sort of piece that, that goes along with that. Um, 
So yeah, it, it's changed because as the threats change and different things sort of migrate, uh, we try to never lose sight of the things that we've done though. Uh, so, you know, the seven or eight sort of major hazards that always sort of we get asked about and loom large, we're always working on those. Um, and then we have a whole nother group where we say, you know what, we're not going to worry about hackers. We're not going to worry about cybersecurity. We're going to trust you. It's, and you guys come in once a year and brief us on what you're doing to make sure we don't get hacked. Right. Uh, if we do get hacked and they manage to shut off a bunch of stuff on campus, then we'll deal with that because now we're just talking like it's a power outage. We're good at that. We can do that. So, uh, you know, we, we try to look at those sort of focuses. Uh, thanks, John, for all that you do. This is uh, wonderful. <laughs> um, I want to ask a more difficult question. Uh, what is the nature and extent of any political radicalism and uh, extremism on campus? Yeah, uh, so um, let me back up a couple of years. Um, when travel to the Middle East got shut down at the height of ISIS uh, popularity, uh, ISIS figured out real quick that uh, they, they weren't going to convince people to come to them. And they started a campaign to uh, have people take action in their own communities with where they were at. Uh, and a lot of college campuses, uh, a lot of large cities and communities saw people acting on that. And so we saw everything from bomb threats to active shooter incidents to whatnot that, that sort of came from that. Not a lot, but a few that were ISIS inspired incidents. Um, what that did is it taught us real quickly how to sort of identify those radicalization aspects and, and what is going on. Um, so back to the behavior consultation team group, uh, if they start getting reports of things that we recognize as radicalization that's going to lead to some sort of domestic terrorism sort of issue, uh, they're, they're the one, they'll point that out in a heartbeat. We get involved with the FBI and, and everybody else in, in how we respond to that. On a more local level, what is, is often more common is, uh, as some of y'all may know, college students are very passionate individuals at times, whether it is staying out all night in freezing weather to get tickets to the basketball game, uh, or it is a political cause or something like that. And so they may show up at an event, they may scream and yell at people and hold up signs, disrupt the event. That's where we work with the DRST, the Demonstration Response and Safety Team. Uh, to sort of work with our students and say, here's what you're allowed to do. Here's what you're not allowed to do. Uh, you know, here's the things that legally we can say that we're not saying you can't say that. We're saying that you can't scream at the top of your lungs in this room full of other people that are trying to do something else uh, because you are disrupting this proceeding of the business of the university. Uh, and so we have a right to then ask them to leave or stop or any of that. We work really hard to not lead with law enforcement officers on that. It's mostly the dean's office and some faculty that have been trained that go in and do that sort of work. Uh, and we usually have them pre-staged at campus events. You'll see them wearing these big red name tags that say free speech on them. Uh, and uh, they're out there to, to do that uh, and, and tamper things down before they get there. Last question. I have a question I'm, and it may be controversial, but I'm curious. Was your department involved in the decision to cancel the art at the museum? So, uh, uh, no. The and I, and I, 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 I can say that with full confidence of the fact that um, the Eskenazi, so uh, recently I finished a, ma a second master's degree uh, in Homeland Security. And my thesis was written on protecting museums and libraries during cultural conflict. Uh, and so that I actually started that before uh, all we even knew about the exhibit before it was even a thing before October, well before October 7th. Uh, and so, but I had talked with the museum quite extensively about that. And so almost as soon as, I think it was like October 8th or 9th, the museum reached out to me and said, hey, how's that thesis coming? Uh, you know, what are you doing? Uh, and so we spent quite a bit of time talking about going through what counter protest to that might look like, what disruption might look like in the art museum. Uh, and, and, you know, from our perspective, because, you know, we're kind of guessing at what we think we're going to see based on what's happened elsewhere. Uh, we, we felt like we probably have a handle on this. Um, we had not, that does not take, that's the physical side of it. We had not considered any sort of political ramifications, financial ramifications, any of that, because in my world, if something's happening, I just send people to it. I don't 
care what it costs to send them to it because that's a response piece. Um, and so uh, those decisions got made by Brian Hall, uh, you know, somewhere higher up in the administration. Uh, but we, we had spent quite a bit of time planning that. Uh, and I was, I was hoping to include a footnote in my thesis on it. Uh, but yeah, so. Thank you, John. Yep. As an, as an alum and a parent of an alum and a grandparent of two alums, it makes me proud to know the planning that's going on to keep us safe at this university. So thank you, John. A donation will be made to the Sycamore Land Trust in, in your name for, for your presentation today. So, so thank you very much. Um, again, we had several people help make this meeting a success. And I, I always forget to uh, announce Jim Bright, our photographer, who does a great job making sure that we get some pictures in the roundabout. So thank you. Our greeter, Rex Hillary. Introduction, rather than introductions, uh, Lynn Swartzberg. Our Zoom host, host Joy Harder. Reflection, David Meyer. A reporter this month, Marilyn Wood, and Tracy Yuhanovic, bitch, our camera operator, and obviously Tyler Martin Nichols for uh, even helping us find out where that erroneous voice was coming from. So thank you. Uh, you'll be glad to know our next meeting will be back in the Frangipani room, and it'll be James Wright. And he's going to talk about an endeavor that's going on in this state to provide medical assistance, and it could be happening here in Bloomington, the Bloomington North Rotary Club is already committed to this, and they'd like to hear, have us hear about this unique project to provide two weeks of medical services, psychological services, dental and optic services presented by the military. So it'll be a very interesting endeavor to hear about, so, so please come. So if you could stand and join me in the four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. First, is it the truth? Second, will it help all concern? Third, will it build you and better friendships? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all concern? And fifth, is it fun? Yeah.